from Singapore. It's Lin Tian after work again uh, on Tuesday, the 30th of June, a momentous day, a day when um, nomination for the general elections took place. And I was at the nomination center in Bandimir Primary School this morning, which was the nomination center for Jalan Besar GRC, Tanjong Paga GRC, Radin Mas, and uh, Bishan Tuapayo GRC. Loads of supporters and, of course, the candidates. And I decided to lead a strong team to challenge Josephine Teo and her PAP colleagues in Jalan Besar GRC. And let me say this. We are not there to make up the numbers. We are not there to lose. We are there to win. And we are confident of winning. But we can win only with your help. And what I need all of you to help us with from now until polling day is to talk to your family members, talk to your friends, talk to your relatives, and ask them in turn to talk to their friends their family members, because you do not realize the change you can effect. At the end of the day, that one-to-one -one talk is the most persuasive. And I wish we had a longer period of time to do house to house. You know, Jalan Besar is a big GRC. There are over 100,000 voters. We will try our best to cover as much as we can. We already have done a lot since February 2019. You know, we were a party that was formed on the 31st of October, 2018. And we started our groundwork in February, 2019. And we have covered parts, many, many parts of Jalan Besar GRC. We have been to places like Kreta Aya, which covers Chinatown. We have been to the opposite end, L Lavender. We have been to Bandimir. We have been to most parts of Jalan Besar GRC, and it is a very well-known GRC to us, but we still have a lot more to do. And unfortunately, not enough time to do it. And I would be so grateful if all of you could help us in this endeavor. It is a common enterprise. It is a common enterprise to hold the incompetent PAP government to account. Now, at nomination today, I met up with Josephine Kyo and her PAP colleagues, Heng Chi Hao, Denise Poa, and uh, Juan Ariza. Pleasant meeting. You know, I introduced them to my members as well. We said hello. We wish each other good luck. But this election, especially in Jalan Besar, is about Josephine Kyo and the incompetence of the PAP government. It is also about the arrogance of the PAP government and how after 61 years of power, they have become deaf to the request, not even the request. It is almost people beseeching them to do something. And yet they turn a blind eye and they refuse and they think that they know it all. It is that arrogant attitude that Singaporeans are so turned off by. Very much like what Tio Chi Hien exhibited in Pasiris Pongo recently, when he won on that walkabout. And you saw his body language in that video where he encountered that man who wore a face mask with a thumbs down to the PAP. And he got flustered, he got angry. But as politicians, you have to accept that there will be people, sometimes many people who are against you. But you should never take offense because at the end of the day, you must respect the will of the electorate. And if you cannot convince or persuade them you must come back and you must try again. But the PAP and Josephine Teo show absolutely no remorse. Look at her answer in Parliament. 
when she was asked the question, will you offer an apology for, to the foreign workers for what has happened in the foreign workers' dormitories, the lives that have been endangered, the sufferings that have been caused? And what was her answer? Her answer was, I have not met a single foreign worker who has demanded for an apology. You expect that foreign worker who earns only a few hundred dollars a month to stand up to you, a minister who's earning, you know, many thousands, probably over a hundred thousand a year, and ask for an apology in a foreign country? I don't think that is right. But time and time again, you find the PAP refusing to apologize for their mistakes. COVID was a big disaster. As I said in my address to the people of Jalan Besar this morning at the nomination center, we have been described as one of the greatest failures for coronavirus. And yet, you have the PAP brazenly telling Singaporeans and the Prime Minister brazenly telling Singaporeans that the 4G leaders have done well. That is such an untrue statement. It deserves being buried a hundred miles below the surface of the earth. But that is how brazen the PAP have become. And it is reflected in the attitude of ministers like Josephine Teo. It is reflected in the attitude of senior party members like Teo Chi Hien. When was the last time you heard a PAP minister offer an apology? I think you have to go back a number of years. And people often make the joke, they'll come up with crocodile tears in parliament or during elections. But there is no sincere remorse. And the same for Gan Kim Yong. This is a health minister that has had fiasco after fiasco on his hands, starting with a hepatitis C saga, even before the last election. To in 2015. It was not revealed until the election was over. And since then, fiasco after fiasco, data leak after data leak, but no remorse. And take note of this, my friends. And this is very important. No government is perfect but people expect a government to self-evaluate and apologize if necessary and assure people that it will do better the next time. Look at the attitude of the Swedish government recently. You know, Sweden took a very different approach to many other countries in the world with regard to COVID-19. When others were locking down, Sweden decided to remain open. Very much like what the PAP tried to do initially. You heard Gan Kim Yong say, you've got to live life as normal. They tried to keep the economy going. And many people initially applauded the Swedish move because it prevented a lockdown of the economy. But very recently, the chief epidemiologist in Sweden admitted that they would have done things differently if they had known the results and the consequences. Because the death toll in Sweden is about 20 times that in neighboring Norway and Denmark, which locked down. And the Swedish government promised that even before summer started, it would have an inquiry. But in Singapore, you don't see that. You see Lawrence Wong telling our people, oh, yes, 
there will be an inquiry at a relevant time. But now is not the time because now we have to pull together to get over this crisis. My friends, there is never a good time when you're in government. There will always be pressing issues. Like most of us have pressing issues in life every day. And we often wish that we could do a certain thing at a better time. But there is never, in actual fact, a better time. And you must have this inquiry as soon as possible to know what went wrong, what mistakes were made, so that you can take corrective action. But that is not the attitude of the PAP. The attitude of the PAP is to hide everything until elections are over and they have a fresh five-year mandate. You have to ask yourself whether you want that type of government, whether you want a government that is never willing to learn from its mistakes, that will always come before you and tell you that it knows best, that will never take in the views of the opposition. The opposition were right, or in, in fact, I should say, people's voice was right. From the way we advocated for certain moves in early February until that shameful U-turn by the Prime Minister on the 3rd of April, everything we advocated turned out to be true and correct. And Josephine Teo is at the heart of this battle in Jalandasa. Because not only is she symbolic of the arrogance of the PAP, she is the one minister that has plunged us into the abyss as far as COVID-19 is concerned. She totally, totally neglected the situation in the foreign workers' dormitories. And so today, I have even lost count of the number of cases now. All right, I think we must be approaching 45,000 or thereabouts, or maybe we have surpassed that. Yes, Indonesia may have overtaken us in the total number of cases, but let's not forget one thing, my friends. Indonesia is the world's fourth most populous nation. Officially, it has a population of about 276 million. But trust me, I lived in Indonesia for many years. I did business there. I always tell people, I believe the true population of Indonesia is closer to 400 million. And it is nothing for a small population like Singapore or a smallish population by, like Singapore relatively of less than 6 million to say that Indonesia has more cases than us. For a very long time, we were the reigning champion in Southeast Asia as far as the number of COVID cases was concerned. Josephine Teo almost single-handedly is responsible for this catastrophe. And what is the result of this catastrophe? The result is that we were forced to go into a prolonged lockdown of two months, which has resulted in the financial crippling of many businesses and many individuals. And it is not only two months, my friends. You have to remember that the crisis started in late January, and the crisis is not over even now. Business has suffered all the way from late January until now. And there is no telling when full normalcy will return. You know, in many countries, a minister would have been forced to resign or would have resigned voluntarily. And I have called repeatedly for Josephine Teo to resign. I have called for various ministers to resign. Josephine Teo is one of them. Gan Kim Yong is one. Ong Yi Kang is the other person. 
they have been total disasters in their jobs. Recently, I was reading of school children being infected or school going children being infected by COVID. Yes, you know, the official line would be again that these children were not infected in school. In all probability, they were infected at home or elsewhere. How can it be, my friends, that now we have had well over 50 cases of school-going children in, being infected, and none, none of them were infected in schools? Are you telling me that? What are the probabilities of that happening? To my reasoning mind, it has to be zero. But that is the narrative all of us are fed every single day. And now they tell us, they have gone back to their line. Oh, the transient risk of catching COVID in public transport and elsewhere is minimal. Do you remember them saying that in February as well? I remember that very well. And people were worried and they were saying, the transient risk of you catching COVID in public transport is low. And that was also a time when they were telling people there is no need to wear the face mask unless you're ill. So why should we believe them, my friends? Why should we believe them? My friends, the battle has been joined. We now know the lineup of the PAP candidates and the candidates from the other parties. As I said in my speech this morning, this is an election for us to bring about a much fairer and prosperous country for the many of us, and not just for the privileged few. It is also a country, it is also an election to ensure that you and your next generation have the best jobs available in Singapore and that those jobs are not given to foreigners. And of course, that is another purview which Josephine Kyo has as the Minister of Manpower. Under her purview, we now have more foreign PMETs than ever. Under her purview, more PMETs were laid off in the last quarter of last year, 2019, than ever. Things must change. And if you were to ask me to grade Josephine Teo on a scale of 0 to 10, I would give her no more than 2. Because she has done absolutely nothing to protect the interests of that Singaporean as far as jobs is concerned. Don't let them fool you by telling you that they're going to create 100,000 job opportunities. In actual fact, they are, they are telling us we are going to create 40,000 new jobs. 25,000 of that, I think, in the government sector and the remaining in the private sector. And they're going to create all these traineeships and upgrading courses where people who go for them are given an allowance or what I call a stipend of $1,200 a month. My fellow Singaporeans, we are better than that. Why should a Singaporean be getting $1,200 when a foreigner doing an s pass job is getting at least 2400 and it can go all the way up to $3,899. And why is a Singaporean getting an allowance of $1,200 when a foreigner having an employment pass is earning $3,900 and above? And it is not because Singaporeans are incapable or unqualified or unwilling 
many of those jobs can be done by Singaporeans, but are going to foreigners because of incredible loopholes in our labor regulations. This, I don't know what they even call it, fair consideration framework or whatever, it has been a total disaster. And for the National Jobs Bank, they don't even dare to report the number of jobs that are going to local Singaporeans. Another thing, they lump PRs and Singaporeans together under the category of locals when it comes to things like unemployment. At the end of the day, people's voice wants the truth. We want to know how many Singaporeans, Singaporeans, I repeat again, are losing jobs every quarter. We want to know how many Singaporeans are being employed every quarter. Those figures must be transparent. And I repeat again, I love it. I love it when the PAP says that this election is going to be about jobs and COVID because we would love to talk about jobs and COVID till the cows come home. It is something that we will never lose out to the PAP. On that basis, my friends, I am going to leave it. I am going to take a few questions, but first of all, I want to answer a question which my good friend Tiaga has and has been pressing me to answer for the last two days and I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to answer that question. And his question is very simple. Is Parliament able to pass a motion to compel the attendance by MPs of parliamentary sittings? Great question, Diaga. Of course it is. You know, it is disgraceful that our Parliament which sits for only several days every month, cannot have almost full attendance at each city. And so many citizens have complained that Parliament is an empty house. Nothing like the vibrant House of Commons you see on television. We can do better than that. And that again shows the arrogance of the PAP because of its overwhelming majority. Members of parliament have lost interest in their jobs. They'd rather be somewhere else doing something else rather than be in that chamber listening to the debate intently and contributing to it. Any candidate, any member of parliament from the people's voice, I assure you, we would attend parliament religiously. We would not miss a single sitting unless there are compelling reasons. It is the duty of a member of parliament, a duty owed to his constituents to attend every sitting of parliament. Totally disgraceful. So Tiaga, Parliament, if it wants to, can definitely pass a motion to compel the compulsory attendance of its members. And of course, related to that, you have to ask yourselves why. Why does the PAP not allow the live telecast of parliamentary settings? It says, oh, there's little interest in it. You know, the ratings are not so good. That is total rubbish. In certain countries, there are dedicated channels to parliamentary sittings. I don't care if there's an audience of 100 or there's an audience of 1 million watching parliamentary sitting. When you are a public figure, when you are a politician, remember this, my friends, you are involved public business. It, you are not involved with private business. 
you are involved with the business of the nation at large and you have to be interested in it. If you rather be somewhere earning private money, fattening your bank account, you have no business sitting in that chamber. I hope I have answered you, Thiaga, and um, I am one for compulsory attendance of parliament. I think as a start, we need to do that until parliamentary members know the importance of attending. And then, you know, you, you do away with the rule. And I'm all for the live broadcast of parliamentary settings. Because right now, I find parliament a joke. I call it the tea party, all right? Every question is a prepared question. The ministers have had weeks to prepare. They get their assistance group to prepare. They read off scripts. And there's never any follow-through questions. I find it a complete joke. Parliament is meant to be almost like a debating chamber. And out of those debates, the best solutions are found. But our parliament is so tepid, it is so boring, no wonder all of them are falling asleep in parliament. Thank you, Thiaga. Thank you again. <laughs> I have here Elwin Wong, who made a comment. Josephine Thio should be only remembered for mentioning the making of babies in small spaces. You don't need much space. <laughs> what a joke from Tapis. Yes, I fully agree. I think, um, you know, Josephine Teo will never be permitted, allowed to live down that joke, you know. Um, it, it has be she has become famous for that, yes. And I have another comment from Acacia Lee. PAP MPs are part-timers who have full-time jobs outside. Yes, that is the unfortunate case. I wish there were a lot more full-time MPs. And mind you, MPs are not getting a pittance. They are paid $16,000 a month. And do you know that that is a lot more than what even a British MP gets. And I see many British MPs are full-time MPs. Yeah. And I've always said this. Singapore pays its public servants very, very well. My dad was a top civil servant. My uncle was a top civil servant. Never once did they complain that they were paid poorly. Yes. Relatively, they were paid poorly in the 70s and the 80s compared to the millions that these ministers and top civil servants are getting now. But if we are going to be paying that type of salary, we deserve a concomitant commitment by them. It cannot be 16000 a month with an empty house at the end of the day. A few more comments before I sign off for today. Just one, you made a brilliant comment which I have reiterated time and time again. HR managers must be Singaporeans only. Totally, totally agree. And this is what I have said before. If PV was to form the government, let me say this. No HR manage, manager's job would go to a foreigner. Why should it? Singaporeans are well equipped with their skill set. There is no reason why a foreigner should be doing that job. And if you allow a foreigner to do that job, they are going to be favoring their own people. And the PV government will never allow that. I have heard horror stories of how Singaporeans have had to turn up for interviews before foreign HR managers and had to go through a very demeaning experience. 
this is a Singaporean country where the Singaporean must have first priority. Foreigners are welcome. We are not a closed society, but we will never allow that foreigners' interests to surpass the interests of the Singaporean. Two more. Sherwin, go, you have said that sleeping members of parliament should be fine. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree. And that is where you need a totally impartial speaker of parliament. And this is a subject I have touched on on many occasions, my friends. I find Tan Chuan Jin a disgraceful speaker of parliament. Disgraceful. I mean no words about that. Do you know that a speaker of parliament is supposed to be totally, totally impartial? Yet I find Tan Chuan Jin, I believe, is a member of the Central Executive Committee of the People's Action Party. I have seen him lead charges against the Opposition Workers' Party. He is almost like a spokesperson for the PAP. And I took great objection. Let me say this. I took great objection in the Bukit Bato by-election of 2016, when the spe then speaker Halima Yaakob came out and basically character assassinated Chi Su Juan. And I was thinking, how can that be? Because if Chi Sun Juan was elected as a member of parliament for Bukit Bato in that by-election, where is the perception of impartiality in parliament when he asks a question and she has to intervene. And there have been so many complaints about Tan Chuan Jin in parliament cutting off WP members. And that is why in a parliament like the British House of Commons, do you know how seriously the speaker's role is? How seriously they take their role? You saw John Burko, that last colorful speaker in the House of Commons, repeatedly ruling against his own party, the Conservative Party, when they were debating Brexit. Yes, the Conservatives didn't like it. Yeah, they, was, they were probably thinking, hey, you're a party member, why are you doing that? But that is the role of the speaker. He has to be fair to both the ruling party and the opposition. And you know what? It is the convention in British politics that the Speaker of Parliament, when it comes to elections, does not even campaign. He does not even campaign. He does not become a spokesperson for the ruling party. And that is why the Speaker of Parliament in Britain is always given a very safe seat because he can almost win without campaigning. Yeah. So I hope you have found this educational. And there are so many ways in which we must improve our parliament. But we are not going to improve our parliament if the PAP are given overwhelming power at every election. And that is why you must never believe Indrani Raja or Teo Chi here, who's trying to persuade you that there is no need to vote opposition because there will be 12 NCMPs. And I say this again, my friends, when it comes to the formation of a government, it is the number of duly elected members of parliament that count. NCMPs may have voting rights, they may have whatever. They are a very weak force, simply by virtue of the fact that their numbers do not count when it comes to the formation of a government. Bear that in mind. 
And so for this election, I want, I request, I hope that many of you will vote for the opposition because we need to reduce that overwhelming majority of the PAP. I thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon, and I will be back tomorrow at 5 p.m. Thank you.